All right. Uh, good evening, guys. Uh, welcome to TechNex, sir. Proud of our guys, Jonah HQ. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, you know Jane and uh, Saloni for making this uh, evening possible. Uh, today we are here to talk about uh, you know uh, scaling clever tap, as you can see. Uh, but before we get into the uh, intense topics about uh, engineering uh, practices, I would like to you know take some time to introduce my colleagues and myself, and also talk a little bit about what exactly clever tap solves for. So, Hi guys, this is Hardik Shah, VP of Engineering uh, at CleverDAP. So, I work as a part of the labs team. Um, we like we we take we have taken up on multiple projects, you know, like Tesseract TV, autoresponders, and so on. Uh, so, I after completing the engineering course, I had joined Microsoft um, to the Windows kernel team back in 2008. Uh, post which I spent about six years uh, into high frequency trading. Uh, so the last system that we built was trading about a billion dollars every day in US markets. Post that, uh, I ran a couple of books, con trading books, uh, post which again, like my love for technology, brought me back to China. Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, I'm Darshan Panya. I'm the associate director of SDK Engineering at Clarita. Uh, I started out as a Java developer in Accenture. Uh, I was there for three years. Uh, after which, uh, you know, uh, I left all that and I jumped into uh, a startup with my friends, uh, initially for backend development. And then, uh, you know, the app wasn't ready at that point of time, so I, uh, you know, jumped into Android development as well. And that's where I found, you know, uh, the love of my life. So uh, that's like uh, Android development, and we just clicked, right? So I went into Android development. Uh, that startup did work out unfortunately, and uh, I joined another one that also did work out. And uh, eventually, I got a call from my friend at CleverTap, and he said they're looking for an SDK developer. Uh, so I was a little bit skeptical, but I joined. Uh, like I gave the interview, I got I got in, and then I realized that I'm the first SDK developer uh, at CleverTap. Uh, so yeah, that was in 2017, and in almost five and a half years, you know, we've grown exponentially. And today I lead a team of 40 people uh, looking into all the SDKs, uh, mobile, uh, Android, iOS, and iOS. So yeah, that's a bit about me. Uh, before getting into engineering specifics, I said I would showcase uh, how we at Clevita approach the Martech industry and what is the problem that we're trying to solve for. So we'll start with uh, you know uh, why we do things. Uh, so the problem statement is here, right? Uh, retention is hard. Uh, for any app or online business, uh, the ideal journey of the of a user is as follows, right? Uh, you acquire uh, the, the person, the person, uh, the user uh, downloads the app, uh, then they go through your uh, core functionality, and then you try to ensure that they come to your app, you know, transact or watch a video, depending on you know uh, what your platform is. And then you want the cycle to keep repeating again and again so that you know you, you make revenue out of it, right? Uh, in the market industry, these are defined as following: uh, acquisition, uh, which costs money; uh, onboarding, which is like the first-time user experience as soon as the person comes online uh, to your app, and you know they, if they are wowed by your app, uh, they keep coming back. Uh, then it's adoption, right? You want to uh, optimize for each experience the user goes through, and then uh, at the end of the day. You know, it's a business for you, so you want them to buy things, watch videos, subscribe to something, <laughs> transact, and then that's that's called conversion. But retention is hard, right? Uh, uh, this is the graph of uh, you know percentage of users active uh, with days since app install, right? And if you see, if, if this is a, this is not a pretty picture for any any business. So uh, so let's dissect why this happens, right? Uh, first of all, uh, there is a low top of the mind recall for the user of your app, right? On an average, there are 50 apps on your phone, and most of which you're just, you know, that's WhatsApp, social media, Facebook, Twitter. That's that's where most of your time goes. Uh, so, according to a study, uh, a user uses only 18 apps at a regular basis. So, your app needs to be one of them. Uh, once the user onboards, there is a high drop off rate. Uh, when it comes to you know uh, transacting, subscribing, watching a video, uh, and once the scale of the app goes you know uh, more than 10,000 uh, daily active users, uh, this problem gets bigger and bigger. So 
Uh, the app needs to have real-time insights and analytics to understand user behavior of their app. And this is for a particular single user, right? So to successfully retain a user, the app needs to reach the right person with the right uh, you know, content at the right time and by the right medium. So uh, retention is also important because uh, okay, these are some studies which have been done. Um, uh, so 67% increase in profits uh, from a repeat customer than a new customer. And a new customer almost uh, you know, costs you 25 times, 5 to 25 times uh, you know, more than your existing customer. Just getting him on board, getting a new person on board. Uh, and also if your uh, customer retention increases by just 5%, the profits increase by 75% and that's why they end. So this is the problem. So, uh, so how does Clevertap solve for this, right? Uh, Clevertap's uh, vision is to provide tech and innovation uh, to help brands build stronger customer relationships. Our mission is to empower digital brands, uh, increase their customer retention and lifetime value of a customer uh, with the help of data personalization, deep tech knowledge, and automation. Uh, so what is Clevertap, right? Uh, there's a uh, you know, big words over here, but Clevertap is an automated, scalable, and secure platform empowering businesses to increase customer retention. Clevertap enables you to connect with your users by collecting profile data and activity from different devices and operating systems. With the help of real-time uh, unified deep data layer and AI ML powered insights and automation, Clevertap helps boost customer lifetime value and their long-term revenue. So, uh, you know, this is you know what we do. Uh, but I would like to bring on Hardik uh, to deep dive into the challenges uh, businesses face when it comes to user retention. Hi, uh, thanks for having me here. So I think one uh, single thing that most marketers have a trouble is identify a user as a single user. So for example, like you have some people targeting via emails, some people via SMS, you know, some third channel, right? So you need to find one way wherein all the different sources or all the different channels, mediums, people handling those channels have a single customer view. Because many of us would have experienced in the past, right? You get an SMS, you get an email, and you get a push notification in a span of five minutes. Now, every one of us will know that, okay, that's a terrible experience because you don't want to be spammed. But at the same time, if you have a single customer view where you look at a customer as one and are able to orchestrate this better, I think that is something you would definitely want. Now, I would like to actually just explain in simple terms what is segmentation. Right? So, let's assume I am an e-commerce provider. Right? Now, what is my biggest goal? Right? My, my conversion event or my biggest goal would be you buy something from my website or from, from my app, right? Now, if there are these broad four categories, right? I divide my users in. Now, I'll actually start from the bottommost one, which is the champion users, right? So if you come like every few days, buy things on my website or the app, you are a champion user for me. The new, new users, right? So for example, you, like there's some campaign that we ran, you know, due to which, uh, uh, you had like uh, 10,000 users joining your platform. Right? So that's like your new users. Then there are inactive users. So as Darshan mentioned, like you might have a plethora of apps uh, uh, installed on your phone, but there are very few that you use. So that, I mean, the ones that you don't use typically goes into the inactive space. And the address, right, who are on the verge of becoming inactive. <coughs> so, or like going to a different platform. So now, as a marketer, as a marketer, if you want to manually segment, you'll find some rules and you'll you know like classify them and uh, you know put it into the appropriate buckets. Now, how does that work? If the scale increases, right? At 400, it's fine because you can actually do a lot of work research into what your users look like. Now, imagine your scale increases to 400. <coughs> now, you need to classify this into the appropriate buckets for each of these users and take different actions for each of them, right? Because like your champion users are to be dealt way different from say an at-risk user or an inactive user or a new user. And similar, each category is unique, right? So segmentation is one way where you can actually have 
rules defined and you can create different segments of users which you can use to you know reach them reach them out so that's how you can, you are able to better retain your customers so now the first example that we talked about right so let's assume you have a, a single user who you reach out via email now you want to like if the link is clicked right then i want to send an in app notification immediately because like you know more more than likely that user <coughs> is going to do some purchase or if you are like an ott platform maybe you're going to view some videos or purchase a premium subscription right now let's assume he opened it but he didn't click it right so then you might want to send a different kind of a push notification after an hour now if he didn't open the email at all then you want to send another email say 5 days later with a different kind of a content with a different kind of uh, you know like a proposition so that the user comes to your platform and if it didn't receive at all you know like for example there was some typo error due to which you know the email is just uh, not right and you get a bounce uh, you come to know that it's a bounced email right so in that case you want to send an immediate push notification with some other kind of now these are all the different channels which we are applying for the same user now imagine like if all the different channels are handled by different people and you want to give a single experience to the user which is not as cumbersome and at the same time is not redundant as well so that's what we called as omni channel campaigns which is like you can actually have campaigns which are split across different kind of campaigns. different kind of channels all right so i think give a example for one person right uh, now you have multiple users behaving differently with your apps right so user a opens the email then he should get an in app he should get an email he should get push notification that was the example uh, you know in the previous slide uh, now let's say for user b you have the phone number as well so instead of an email you probably send him an sms for c let's say you know uh, that person is your champion user so you know that the person is coming on your app so and they will respond to a push notification better so you reach out to a, uh, reach out to them via push a push and then you know the same thing continues right you send out an in app you send out an email and you know the same thing continues uh, let's say for user d you don't even have their email address right but you have the phone number so first you want you want to send them a campaign sms campaign uh, and then the chain continues right and again like user e but you don't have the phone number so again you, and but they are a very frequent user so you again send them a push first and then you know in app an email and depend on when they convert uh, this gets a little tricky when you want to do it at scale right because now every every person coming to your app uh, wants to feel valued and wants to you know uh, do uh will have their own mindset and you want to reach them out probably uh, figure out you know what they like and stuff like that so uh that's where you know uh it's you know important that uh, you know you collect the data uh correctly you generate insights and then you segment users and then you engage users and once you engage the users you uh the data about their engagement as well right like whether they opened the in, in app or they opened the email or they saw the sms click on the sms stuff like that all gets back to collection of the data and uh, you know uh, and the cycle continues right i'll let hathi continue now okay so yeah i mean one single big advantage right with the uh, platform like clever tap is for collecting the data for engagement <coughs> for insights for segments don't need to have multiple platforms doing this right because as like this is almost an established fact that a single customer view and looking at this in a unified fashion gives way higher value compared to viewing this in silo so yeah. so uh so uh currently clevertap powers more than 10000 apps uh on both the play store and the app store and uh, yeah and 
we are also the most popular SDK in the engagement category on both the platforms. Uh, and this is not by me, this is by App Figures, which is a, a leading uh, app optimization and app intelligence tool. Uh, and the, we reach out to like 2 billion devices. Uh, and if there are any, like, if anyone can guess how many dev high smartphone devices are in the world, uh, that's 4.3 billion active smartphone users worldwide, and we reach out to almost 2 billion of them. Uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, okay. um, so guys, we actually end up handling about a trillion user behavior actions per month. Any guesses on how many actions does Facebook handle? Like every month? Any guesses around that? So Facebook handles around 19 billion user actions per month. So this is roughly 10 times of that. Now the user actions we have classified, which uh, they classify in their earnings reports and all, are likes, comments, shares, and ad clicks. So that's the scale we handle. <coughs> so we send about 200 billion messages every month. Now that roughly maps to 77,000 messages per second. And this is the scale of the data that Levita has, like the customer data. Guys, any guesses on how big is the Google index data? Like, any, any guesses on that? It's about 100 petabytes. So, next on to how we do this. Because, like, with scale, you should be able to handle, you know, the, the workloads which are going up and down. At the same time, uh, you know, the customers who are growing, like uh, we have seen our customers grow at an exponential rate. So we need to be able to have that infrastructure which allows us to grow at the same pace that the customer does. So this is how like, our model integrated retention platform looks like on a very high level. Right? So we do have these data interfaces, like the desktop, the mobile, third party, which generates data. Then you have the data layer, right? So this is where we store the user data, the user actions, um, you know, the reachability tokens, emails, phone numbers, etc., etc. And this is where you get the clever type advantage, right? The single view to everything. Now, this data helps us generate insights. Like, for example, right? If you if you are a, a you know app provider and you want to see how many uninstalls are happening, so that if if you want, you can take actions based on that, right? Because like, if users are just uninstalling your app or going away from your app in the address, inactive space that you have. So those things you can do. Then segmentation, of course, we talked about it in detail. Like the various ways, RFM is uh, one popular established marketing model. But there are multiple ways that, I mean, you can actually create your own set of rules and uh, you know create segments the way you want to do it. And then there's an engagement tool here, right? Because that uh, allows you to send push messages, your emails, your messages, and so on. So this is how our broad, uh, you know, the architecture looks like. Now coming to the platform architecture. Right? Um, so you have these desktop and mobile apps. Um, they contain respectively the Clevita app SDKs, which communicate directly to our data collectors. Now data collectors are the first publicly available endpoints uh, to which your apps and SDKs directly interact. So these are typically lightweight, stateless, uh, 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 you know, uh, processes which, uh, after collecting the data, route it to the appropriate queue. Uh, so think of it this way: right? every customer might have its own queue. I'm just you know, you know putting it very simplistically, but it's more complicated than that. And then you have these queue back data processors, which have some amount of business logic, but not a whole lot. Like again, this is a very stateless uh, thing as well, which actually subject the data onto the data source. Now both the data collectors and the data processors, they can be scaled up and down depending on the requirements, right? So for example, like if the e-commerce uh, provider tells us that, oh, you know, like tomorrow we have a big sale, we can expect uh, nearly 10 times the regular data. So then of course we take the appropriate steps and scale up the collectors and the processors. And then we have these data stores. They are, they are much more stateful in nature. And, uh, 
they store all the user and the event data. Uh, and by the way, this data stores is completely proprietary in-house database that we have built specifically for solving this problem. We we'll talk about more about the Tesseract DB uh, in the coming slides. Uh, and they have a sharding scheme. Uh, now, what do I mean by sharding is like when you actually want to handle higher amounts of data, you can either increase your infrastructure, right? Because like you can take bigger power, bigger power, bigger power. And there's a vertical limit that you reach. You can't go beyond that. So now you actually split it across multiple hosts or multiple machines, which individually handle specific amounts of data. And we have this data very well distributed. Like, for example, if you run a query, uh, like, and, and we have some n shards, then all these n shards return data which is less than 0.01 percent of all. That tells you how well distributed and balanced the data is across the multiple shards. And then we have a message delivery service. Right? So, for example, if you want to send out all the users, okay, welcome 100, take this, as your open to come to a platform, and so on. Right, so you have a delivery service. Of course, we have mentioned about APNS and FCM here, but we have emails and uh, that. So we support uh, almost most of the you know the marketing channels that people use these days. I'll actually now give to that. All right. Uh, so we'll start. Uh, uh, since the first piece was uh, SDK, where the data gets uh, ingested, uh, we'll start with the overview of the SDK. Uh, the app is responsible for integrating the SDK, whether they're native Android iOS or hybrid SDKs for hybrid frameworks like Flutter, React Native, Cordova, <coughs> and stuff like that. Uh, the SDKs expose public APIs, uh, you know, to raise user events and user attributes. So, for example, uh, your transaction becomes a user event, while your uh, language or your age or your phone number becomes user attributes. Right? Uh, these events and user attributes are uh, passed in real time to CleverTap backend servers via uh, the network calls. Uh, we, I'll just go a little bit deep into the SDK architecture as well. Uh, the SDK architecture is uh, broadly optimized for three things, right? Uh, first one is uh, the real timeness of the data. Uh, you know, the SDK needs to ensure that the data is sent as quickly as possible. So we have our own networking uh, framework uh, in our SDK, which ensures that you know uh, every one second the data gets transferred, uh, whatever data we have. We, we, we transfer it uh, to our uh, backend servers. Uh, one more requirement is the order in which the events are done, right? So, for example, when you launch the app uh, and uh, launch the home screen viewed is an event, and then you click on the add to cart and then you buy, so it needs to maintain the order, right? Uh, so, for this, uh, we have written our own queuing mechanism uh, using handlers and threads uh, in Android and iOS uh, to you know ensure that the uh, the, the, the you know, it's all in a proper queue, and uh, you know, uh, once so initially, like when I when I joined Cloudflare like some years back, uh, the, a simple handler and thread queue would be very easy, uh, was enough to you know just send the data, right? But over time, we we also you know uh, uh, optimized it even better. So now what we do is that we have three different queues mainly. One is to do all the background tasks, uh, the business logic on the on on a background thread. Uh, we have a separate thread to do I/O tasks like writing profile, writing to your shared preferences in your uh, in your in the app memory, and then we have uh, you know uh, a specific thread to handle callbacks to the main thread. So in-app notifications, inbox notifications, uh, anything which is you know has to do with the UI of the app, uh, we need to send callbacks uh, to the main thread because that's where the UI works. So uh, we have a separate uh, th thread for that. Uh, so the second thing is that it's uh, you know uh, optimized for performance, right? So our SDK for both Android and iOS is less than one MB, and if you ask any app developer, they'll know that you know what is the importance of the ATK size or the final app size when you are you know publishing it to the Play Store. Uh, so it's less than one MB, and uh, so everyone you know must have heard of uh, exponential backoff, right? Uh, you implement exponential backoffs. To not load your servers, uh, you know, uh, at once uh, and exponential as it says. So it's like you know, it will try every one second, two seconds, four, say four, eight, and so on and so forth. But we have the first requirement, which is real timeness, right? So even if our backend servers are down, we want to send the data as soon as they are up, right? So what we what we did was uh, we introduced something called a random step backoff, 
which basically uh, the, the logic goes like this. It is one second and then you pick a random number between 0 to 9 and add it uh, to 1 and then that's the time after which it will track. Right? This solves for two things. One is, uh, you know, we don't uh, load our servers as soon as they are back up. Uh, what we were seeing that, you know, once uh, the server is back up and if everyone tries to hit the servers again, they would again fail. Right? Uh, so to avoid that and uh, to ensure again, like as soon as they are up, you know, the data reaches them. So, hence uh, optimize for performance. And the last thing is optimize for devices, right? So support for low-end devices. Uh, so imagine this, uh, our Android SDK supports Jelly Bean, which was released in 2012. Uh, and in iOS, it supports iOS 9, uh, which was released in 2015. Uh, this is because we want to reach the maximum number of users uh, an app has, right? And in countries like uh, Southeast Asia, like Indonesia, Philippines, uh, they, they, they still do use the really, really old versions of uh, iOS and Android. Coming back, uh, coming to SDK stats a little bit, uh, if you see this, this is a chart, uh, a screenshot of a chart uh, by the Google uh, SDK index. Uh, so I'll quickly explain uh, this over here shows like approximately 10,000 apps with 100,000 installs. We have approximately 1,000 apps with a million installs and 1,000 apps with 10 million installs. And we have approximately 100 apps with 10 million plus installs, right? Now, you know, if you would, if I would, if I could create another bar over here, we would have at least 50 apps with more than 100 million plus installs. So that's the scale we are dealing with over here. Uh, so, what are what are the problems for a client side SDK at scale, right? So, you know, earlier when the SDK team was just two developers, uh, we were uh, building around 12 SDKs, uh, building and maintaining around 12 SDKs. Uh, now we have more partner integrations, and with the recent uh, acquisition of Leadplum, uh, my 12 member team now hold uh, maintains 31 SDKs, and we're still counting. Uh, so. With so many SDKs, definitely there are problems. First one being keeping up with technology, right? So there is an Android and iOS version out every year. And uh, apart from just the Android and iOS versions, uh, Android has different screen sizes, iOS has different screen sizes. Like there's a Pro, there's a Pro Max, and you know, uh, Samsung has foldables. So because we're also dealing with UI stuff like in-apps, uh, in-app messages, uh, we need to be taking care of everything. Uh, after the Android and iOS updates, uh, we are supporting hybrid network, hybrid frameworks as well, right? So every big and small innovation done by Flutter, React Native, uh, whatever, Unity, everything, we need to keep an eye on, uh, and we need to be proactive about, uh, you know, uh, building it, because uh, if there's something new, right? Like, for example, uh, I think six months back, uh, Flutter came out with null safety as one of the features. And uh, within a week of it, uh, we had customers saying that, okay, you know, what are, what are you doing about it? And within one week, we had to actually, uh, you know, uh, implement null safety into our Flutter SDK and release it. Uh, third thing is uh, introducing dynamic behavior in the SDKs, right? So honestly, if ask any app developer, they do not like to update SDKs, or they, they just don't, uh, you know, I think, Every engineer follows, you know, fix, uh, don't fix what, what is not broken, right? So they will not update uh, their SDKs. Uh, so what we're trying to uh, innovate on is that we we introduced uh, some server controlled flags uh, so that the SDK, you know, does a few things which are controlled by the server. So for example, uh, for our push notification campaigns, right? Uh, we uh, we do have an event called uh, push impressions, which is basically as soon as your push notification is rendered, we capture that. Uh, but then that is server controlled, uh, and the app can decide when, uh, sorry, the, the marketer who's using the dashboard can decide when and for which campaigns do they want that specific data to, to be collected. And this will, and uh, you know, the main point of it is that it does not require an app, app update. So, and the last thing is uh, testing, right? Uh, so testing is important, and with the number of SDKs that we are, uh, you know, we are, we are maintaining, writing and maintaining unit tests, automation tests, uh, UI tests, end-to-end uh, -end tests, and you know, then putting it all together in a CI/CD pipeline so that it can be automated is a never-ending task. Uh, and we have to, you know, uh, you know, keep an eye on top of everything, right? 
uh, and hence, like, yeah, the 12 member team. So, uh, that's it. And I will, you know, now call Nadik to explain the backend challenges uh, which we face. Thanks, Okay, so, like, <clears throat> as discussed earlier, like, we have, like, a distributed, uh, you know, host of machines which uh, do the data collection, do data processing, do data stores, and like when you are managing these many machines or these many systems or these many processes, right? So just to give you a sense, distributed systems are spread across regions. Now each region has many stacks because like each of the individual like multi-sharded uh, cluster that we talked about, we call it stack. And you have multiple stacks, so like uh, some of the data uh, goes into stack 1, some of the data goes to stack 2, stack 3, and so on. And now, now this data is actually for a given customer, it's on a single stack. So each region has many stacks, and each stack has multiple shards. So now these data collectors, processors, data stores, messaging service, they all work in tandem, right? Because each one is dependent on each other. Like for example, the collectors and the processors pump the data into the data stores. The data stores are queried by the messaging service because they want to know who to reach, how to reach, and all that. Right? So you there's there's always an interconnected thing that's going on. Now, what like when you have such an interconnected system, there's always a challenge because if one thing goes down, nearly everything to a certain extent gets filtered. So like how do you handle that? Right? And then if one thing goes down, how do you make sure that the other processes are not affected? Because if suppose the messaging service has been given the task of reaching out to some customers, if it knows it already, it doesn't really depend on the data source. So removing those dependencies and making sure that you know if one of the things go down, everything doesn't triple down is also an important thing you need to keep in mind while you are designing a distributed system. So, so how do we actually achieve this entire thing? So first, key thing is the monitoring part, right? Because we have like some, we, we use this option infrastructure. I mean, I'm sure most of you would be aware, but for those who don't. So it's an infrastructure that allows people to be on call or on support who are immediately called if anything goes wrong. So all the systems are by default support something known as a health messaging system. Right? So like there's a system which continuously tracks, since you, using since you, we track that. That, what is the real status of that system? So if that system doesn't respond for say some n minutes, which is the configured time, then you immediately call people so that people can go and see what's going on. Then you have Slack. Now, systems and all are running fine, but some functionality is uh, giving you issues, right? Of course, you are logging data, it's there on Splunk. But often, like, it takes a long time for something from Splunk to come to the uh, person. Right? So you have these dedicated channels of different systems where people actually slack it and then like someone, uh, some expert will go back and see what's really happening. So that's how we use the monitoring part. Then the deployment, right? Now like when you have these many systems, these many stacks, these many regions, how do you manage the deployment? So of course we use Bamboo for, uh, you know, deploying Bamboo and Dockers and, uh, you know, that entire infrastructure. But we allow a stack level granularity. Now, why a stack level granularity is? Because, like, say, for example, if you want to, if you're making a very big change, right, and you want to actually see how it goes, you know, on one stack, you can do staggered release, basically, and they are fully integrated with your alert system. And then around the processes, because, like, when you have a big uh, development team and everyone's working on their own set of things, how do you ensure that there's poor quality, right? I mean, like you ensure that we have some approvals process, we have some sonars, all, all, all of them ensure, ensuring you know the quality of the code that gets merged is, is, is good. Then you have to follow good documentation to be able to, uh, because like if one developer finish, finishes the work, the second guy should be able to pick it up. And the last thing is the staggered release. We really promote that because like there are times where you want to go global, there's, there's no doubt about it, but like you just want to see how things go on some stack, if there's a big change. So that's how we actually manage, uh, you know, the entire processes and uh, 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 stuff in the engineering. Now we talk about, now we talk about uh, the Tesseract team. Okay. So, so this is again our in-house uh, uh, proprietary database uh, that we have written 
to handle the martech problem at scale so earlier so we had so this is actually in the version in number you make sense this is the third version of the uh, you know of the in house database that we have so with the second version it was accounting for nearly 60 to 70% of the overall compute costs right uh, it was all the data was in memory which is in ram and it followed a row based uh, uh, you know storage structure now there are these ever increasing data workflows right for example if when the customers or anyone scales up the stuff like they have a lot of data coming in now with everything being being in ram you have this challenge where like either you actually uh, end up using more resources and you know like grow uh, as the customer grows or there is a need to actually address such that you have only the optimal amount of data and ram and you can use uh, you know possibly say cheaper storage for storing uh, you know the uh, the full data and of course the capabilities of this area the amount of things that you can so the goal that we were chasing with Tesseract DB was a consistent cost performance. So basically, if the if tomorrow the customer starts throwing ten times data at us, the cost should not go up significantly. Like it should be capped at a certain level. So that was one of the goals that we had with Tesseract. So how we achieved this is by converting the row-wise data into columnar data. Right. So now by columnar data there are these RC uh, files which is a very popular open source uh, uh, storage format, well documented but we adapted this out of this to our proprietary format to the way we needed it. There was of course a, like we converted this into columnar and stored the data on S3. Now everyone knows that S3 or like uh, something like an S3 kind of a storage is significantly slow compared to when you compare to the data that was present in RAM. Now that performance dip right, due to the S3 storage was offset by columnar way of querying data. Now think about it this way, right? For example, you are querying 1 GB of data row wise, in which you are decoding each and every row, versus if there are 10 columns, and let's assume the columns are uniform, then if you need only two columns, you are just need you just need 20% of the data, right? You don't need that entire full size, full file or full data to analyze something. So that's where like optimal uh, you know data read was one of the ways we uh, offset that dip in performance. And then we moved on to the graviton processors. So these are the ARM based processors which have nearly 25% cost savings compared to your Intel based uh, processors. So we also faced some challenges with graviton uh, which of course we actually solved it with Amazon's help. Uh, like they had some, some of the issues with you know the uh, the kernels or the the JVM and everything, but of course that that is a part of the adoption process. And they offered a good balance between the network and the kernel. So now the next next topic uh, that we touch upon is the build versus buy. Right? So anyone like who is in the decision making will always have this problem, right? Whether I should be building it or I should be buying it, software, right? Because uh, so this is how like we at ClearTap um, take this call. First is like what is the problem? Is this a common problem or a unique one that the company specific uh, company specifically fixes? Right? So that is the first question we ask. Second is do we have the necessary funds to see to completion, even if it goes over budget? Because like often we have observed like the estimation and all like by the time you are there uh, that number goes up. And third is the timeline, right? If this project is not solved soon, what is the impact? Right? So these are the three questions we normally ask when we go to build versus buy decisions. So again, like one one golden rule that we follow is the decision to build or buy must be viewed through the lens of systems thinking, right? And we should consider the pros and cons of each of them because like there's no one single rule which will tell you that you should do this or you should do that. So now, what are the reasons we we take normally to build? Is first is it's fully customizable, right? It's it's all the code, everything is in your hands. So you can fully customize it to the way you need. You are not dependent on someone else's data and security, right? So you see a lot of these data compromises and things being reported. Uh, so you're not at someone else's mercy. It's it's all in your hands. 
Now, what are the reasons not to build, right? Because if there, there were reasons to build, there should be reasons not to build. So there's a lack of focus, right? For example, there are some people, there's a third party, there's a solution provider who is investing his 100% time into doing that, right? So, in fact, we have our customers, we had our customers, Path, who had actually a separate team to set to solve this particular retention problem. And we were able to offer them at a much lesser cost because we have we have it solved and for us it's a it's like we are a SaaS provider. So so there's there's always this lack of focus because like that's not the main problem you're solving anyways. The second is the opportunity cost, right? Because we all know we live in a constrained world and like you have ten choices today given the resources you have. So if you leave if you start focusing on certain problem you're giving up something else. So that that's an opportunity. Now what are the reasons to buy? For example, you are working on some narrow time time horizon, right? Like for example, if there is some solution which if, if you don't prepare or if you don't if you're not done with, right, it could threaten the product itself. So then of course like you need to uh, buy it for the time being. And if, if it is something that you want to customize it, maybe you work in parallel. The economies of scale. Now this is a far underrated thing because uh, like when you talk about one or two units or ten units. The pricing works way different from the volume part of it, right? Because like with AWS, like when we go to negotiate, you get some rates which possibly like it's not it may not be even possible for uh, you know the outside world to get. So the economies of scale work very differently. Now what are the reasons not to buy? You are exposed to a partner's risk because you are at the mercy of someone else for your things to run. And there could be an inadequacy in the solution because what you are looking to solve, they have just sold say 80, 90 percent of the problem. So yeah, I mean it's never an easy choice to make, right? So, so, so I'm just going back to the mm -hmm. videos of why I'm cancer, right? Yeah. They fit all these checkboxes. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So in fact, that build versus buy decision was taken very long back because. Tesla TV, as mentioned, was the third iteration of the, uh, you know, first third major version of the uh, in-house database. So possibly it was taken at, at the first version, and uh, we we already see the fruits of it, right? Because like when we wanted to grow beyond a particular level to provide data or, or provide solutions in the way we wanted to price it, uh, we had to innovate and we got the chance. Because had we adopted, say, like a Mongo or some other database to suit our needs we would have been stuck with their design and their way of things. So, like, uh, I mean, so that, that's why, again, that Tesseract DB is helping us solve the core business problem that we are addressing, right? because it's a problem of retention. But at the same time, there are some, there's some data uh, which we store in Mongo as well, which is not the primary thing, but like something which we need, uh, you know, so, so it's not that we don't use it, because uh, not everything can be built, but at the same time, it's about prioritizing. You know what you need and how many. Are they? Mm -hmm. Did you jump from a row based DB to Tesseract directly, or did you use any alternative polymer DB like the house and so on so forth before you took a decision to? Yeah, so actually, uh, we, I mean, we had we had this option where we could have uh, just used some third party libraries who would allow us to store the data in a columnar way. Um, but again, we have had experiences in the past where we wanted the full control of the way we do things because it would have been more of an effort to convert that library or that piece of open source code into the way we want it. Would have been a much bigger effort compared to writing it fully ourselves. So, again, to give you another example, actually, uh, in the build versus buy. Uh, so, we talked about Mongo, right? So, there was a particular version that we had upgraded Mongo servers to. And due to some crazy behavior, it was like nearly recovering itself for six long hours. Now, now this is something you can't control. You just have to do a tail log and just wait and hope that it, it comes back online. So for the real mission critical things, um, that, that that's where like when once things go at a particular scale, you really have to have like maximum control over it or for the mission critical ones. And then, like, of course, it's not that we don't use anything in the open source space. We do, and we also contribute a few things to the open source. But, uh, I mean, the the bottom line is the mission-critical ones are completely in our hands. I have a 
ask question. So when you actually launch Tesseract, for example, you have three points, right? You have data ingestion, mm -hmm. you have existing data which you need to migrate, and then you have data fetching, which is going live as well. Okay. And all three has to go at the same time, right. the same time span, because you can't miss out any data at that point. Right. What were those migration, I mean, the switch over right. challenges when you right. So the migration challenges were uh, far too many, I would say. Uh, so, the mi so basically it was a two-step thing. First step was to make the existing data with the newer version. Okay. So there we achieved that with a very minimal amount of changes, and we deployed it all all across the all across the group. Where the way you store the data slightly changed. Once that was done, we had some blocks of data that had become that could not change. Uh, in that was the primary change that we did, and then we used some amount of data to be able to convert in in a staging environment, which is not interfering with the production. And once we were successful doing this, we actually went to the production and uh, uh, went live. So in the eyes of the customer, it was like less than a few hours of downtime. I mean. It was a usual maintenance upgrade for them. It was it was nothing uh, different. For them. So yeah, thanks thanks for asking that. Actually, that that was a I mean we, we had so many of these nights uh, where uh, we were actually migrating one stack at a time. Good. Actually, I'll hand over the. Okay, so I'll just, uh, this is almost near to the end of it, uh, just wanted to give you one end-to-end uh, -end scale example, right? So this is, uh, this use case is for lineup announcements on a fantasy sports app, uh, where we send out across approximately 25 million push notifications in a minute. Uh, so how do we do this, right? So first, we pre-warm up the campaigns. Uh, what, do you, what we mean by pre-warm up is that uh, you know we do all the computation, uh, you know, uh, you know, much in advance, like at least half an hour in advance, uh, so that everything is up in memory, and it, at the time of firing the campaign, it should just go out. Uh, along with this, what we do is that our data collectors, uh, which are being explained that they are stateless uh, collectors, uh, they auto scale. Uh, to predict, uh, like with the prediction model, that this much data that is going out, like uh, if 25 million notifications are going out in a minute, there may be you know people interacting with it, and all that data will come back to us as well, right? So uh, the data collectors auto scale up, and then you know we personalize during the pre warm up. You know we do all the personalization and everything. We keep it ready, and then we you know send it out uh, to you know SCM, APNS. And that's when you know it, the SDK receives the push payload, and you know we uh, push out impression events for all the users who were supposed to get the you know uh, push notification. And you know the, uh, since the CleverTap uh, collectors or you know were already scaled up, we can process all this data in real time. And uh, we usually so IPL matches start at 7:30, the lineups go out at 7. And we are able to deliver push notifications to almost their entire user base in five minutes. So yeah, that was the example I wanted to share. Uh, thank you so much. We, I will open up for questions now. I mean, uh, I get it why why they were made in the first place, right? Like the whole concept where Android started was open source. You know, you can do anything and everything with it, customize it. Uh, and then uh, once, uh, I think around gingerbread or something, that's when Google realized there is potential and then you know, they started restricting things. But right, uh, but the cat is out of the bag already, right? Like it was open source. Uh, and even today, uh, AOSP, which is the main Android source code, is still open source, which is used by all these OEMs. And uh, I think if there's one thing which I would, you know, if I could tell all these Chinese OEMs is like, uh, you know, just figure out longer battery life than battery optimizations, right? Like because battery optimizations, uh, there is today's phone has like a standard 4000 mAh battery, right? And you want uh, people to use it for two days, right? Which is impossible because 
everyone is spamming you with everything, and then you're using WhatsApp and Instagram, which is like draining your battery. But uh, I think there should be some innovation on battery life rather than just you know just battery optimizations, uh, because. There we, we have faced issues where you know uh, we want to reach out like we want to do reach out critical campaigns and then they don't get sent out because of battery optimization. So yeah, uh, that but you have to live with it. I am like there's no other choice. I, uh, that's why like you know I like iOS better. They have a very controlled environment about what you can do, what you cannot do. Uh, but it's it's standard, right? Like if an iOS nine or an iPhone ten or eleven will behave the same way as iPhone fourteen. Right, so that's that's what I like about iOS. So who is your most competitor? Like in the market industry, there are there are many uh, competitors. Uh, okay, uh, there is there is Moigage, there is Breeze, there is uh, uh, Adobe Analytics. So Amplitude, Mixpanel. Uh, so yeah, I mean. So, I would. It's competitors because what we are doing, like you know, I think if you must have seen that slide, like, there is one holistic approach we are following at Clever Tab, right? Like, uh, so for example, Amplitude gives you only analytics, right? It does not give you push notifications and engagement. Uh, we are trying to do that as well. Uh, so for all. It is via like third party uh, it's both, right? You can, you, if you have, or you already have a third-party integration for. Uh, I think uh, there, there are, you know, quite famous uh, SMS, SMS partners, uh, Gupsha or you know, uh, Twilio. Yeah, right. So if you already have an integration with them, the Clever Tab supports that, and you can probably use it with Clever Tab as well. Alright. So, awesome. If that works for you, yes. The phone. Uh, so, uh, there's there's no secret information, right? Like, so Android provides APIs to collect your, uh, you know, app buckets, uh, which is something like you know how much a person uses your app. Uh, it's, it's quite recent, right? Like they came out with came out with app buckets in Android 9 onwards. Uh, then there is a device type, or you know uh, whether your Bluetooth is enabled or not. And all. So being compliant with uh, GDPR and everything, we have flags to switch off, switch on, and collect that data uh, for you know for analytics as well as diagnostic purposes as well. And actually, server push Uh, we, for us, because we are into more into a promotional space, it's it's server push. Yeah, that's that's where Chinese OEMs come in, right? Like, so if you now uh, uh, and if you go and talk to an Android developer about setting up an alarm, so. To do a local push notification at a at a certain interval in time, you need extra permissions from your user because you want the alarm manager uh, permission, right? Uh, to set an exact alarm. So if if I want to send a local push notification at seven o'clock, uh, I need the user to give me alarm permissions. Now, as soon as you open the app and if your app is asking for an alarm permission, you know people are going to get scared. Like, why does he want my alarm? Uh, so. Uh, first is that, so get, let's say even if you get the alarm thing, right? So now there are multiple ways to set the alarm, uh, out of which like only one way works, and then the other ways are just approximate, right? It's hit or miss. So either you will get it at 6.55 or you will get it at 7.05, but you will not get it at 7. Uh, then the other ways to do it is to, you know, schedule job schedulers, which will, you know, at a specific time, but again, they are not accurate. Uh, they are not accurate because Google itself uh, has made it that way. They uh, again, Google also wants to save battery, so they also uh, run your job schedulers, background job schedulers, in a way that your battery is optimized. So, yeah, the closest bet is to you know push it from the server. Uh, so, 
so uh, we I had I had one major issue uh, with ANRs, right? Uh, Android ANRs are a nightmare because they are a very difficult thing to debug because you just get a heap dump of what happened when the crash happened and it's not like a Java exception, right? Like, okay, this is where there was a null pointer, right? Uh, so, a couple of years back we started getting, uh, you know, ANRs because we had introduced a job scheduler mechanism to, uh, you know, for our push delivery as well, right? Uh, now, it took me a few weeks, a couple of weeks at least, to figure out because now usually it's like an ANR is because your app uh, is doing something heavy on the main thread which is supposed to be the UI thread so you just need to show the UI. Uh, this ANR was happening in the background so they were like the person, the user would never know that this is happening but silently your app is failing in the background always. So there was no way to you know where is the entry point as well right so because anyways you don't get the stack traces at uh, took us a few days to realize that uh, actually I had to go down deep into AOSP code uh, where I figured out that uh, you know this Android OS itself below Oreo actually Oreo and below Oreo was doing something on the main thread which it was not supposed to do and uh, I spoke to a few Google developers as well who were working on the Android team and they said we fixed it in Android 9 and I was like what about the people who are already using Oreo and you know people below Oreo can't do anything about it. Is so. it It's a big challenge. Uh, what we usually do is so whenever a new Android version comes out Google itself says that okay we are removing support for the lowest version. Uh, so whatever lowest version Google is supporting right now, we have to reach there. That's all. Yeah, I mean, uh, this, the, uh, it's about, you know, if we can go, honestly I can go up to like, you know, let's say even today, if you're supporting Jelly Bean, I can go up to Lollipop or something. But then there will be someone who's there, right? And then, like, you know, for us, they, and for the business, right? It becomes an unreachable user because Clevertap is not, uh, working for that person and that person cannot be reached and basically that person is out of the data which is being collected and you know being segmented and everything which they are which we are doing on top of it uh, and we don't want to leave anyone out so as low as possible that's the only solution and the biggest challenge over there is then you know different APIs right like uh, because Android was so open uh, you know for the lower versions we had to there were a lot of APIs which you could use which then got restricted going upwards and now you have to like there are chunks of code where I have if Android this, then do this, and if Android this, then do this, and if Android the lowest, then do this, right? Uh, because those APIs are not supported and all that. And then we have to ensure that it works on all these devices. We we do use browser stack for our UI testing because uh, they have the biggest uh, suite of uh, virtual devices. Uh, it gives all the logs. Uh, so uh, it gives you a little like. It's as good as running it on an emulator, right? So it gives you the entire console logs. Uh, it does give you uh, the networking profiler and the CPU profiler and all that stuff. It does give you that. Uh, it's a little bit limited, but then yeah, you get what you uh, what they they at least give it to you later when your session is done, right? So you can re record the entire session and then it will give you a report that how much CPU was used throughout your session, how much memory was used, and so on. Yeah, so uh, Graviton offered us nearly 25% cost benefit. Again, each region has its own pricing. Uh, but of course, with that 25%, uh, their CPU are also clocked lower. So if you are doing 100% uh, compute, then you don't stand to gain anything. But rarely are our processes 100% compute. Because like we, our utilization would be say 3%, 5% max. I like that. If you average it over uh, you know, a day or a month. Uh, so that's where we saw that as an opportunity because uh, although the clock is slower, but on an average it will still turn out to be the same. No, so actually, I mean the nice thing about uh, you know the AWS or the cloud uh, partner that we have 
is they had the kernel, they had the JVM, everything supported for that. So technically, if anything is to go wrong, it's uh, it's again a bit versus buy. Uh, of course, we can't afford to uh, you know, create a cloud infrastructure for ourselves. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, we have got very good support from there. Um, there were issues, by the way. Like, there were issues such that uh, all the threads are stuck to get a lock, which was available. Now, that was a bug in their kernel, which they fixed. So, yeah, I mean, we have had uh, adoption issues, but now we are way past that. Like, in the last, I would say, eight, nine months, we haven't had an issue as such with uh, the cloud companies. Do you also have a platform where customers can configure the push notifications that they want to Yeah. So, there's one very critical component which we haven't talked a lot about is the dashboard, which is like the uh, the, our customers, I mean, I'm not talking about the end users, the customers that you know, signed with Clevertap, they can go and they have a view in which they can figure out campaigns, they can do the analytics, uh, and all these things. Uh, so they can def define the journeys, for example, like the personalization thing that I mentioned, that if the email is not clicked, do this, do that, all those things. You can create a beautiful graph journey where you can actually track the life cycle. Because uh, this, depending on which stage the, your uh, uh, customer is in, you want to treat him in a certain way. So that's that's one of the very important uh, USPs we have. And you also collect data from the website, I assume? Yes. So we have web SDKs as well. Uh, just like the way we have app SDKs. Uh, however, like uh, like the recent trend is most of the data comes from app SDK as compared to yeah. web and other things. Yeah. But yes, of, of course, we support uh, web SDKs as well. And the majority of the customers from India or? No, we have presence work. How do you uh, go about uh, setting up a data collection strategy? So we are starting with analytics from scratch right now. And users are performing certain actions in the app. Like you follow a bottom up of those page on every action you document and you start collecting events along the So uh, so so it depends on yeah, what your app is, right? Uh, I think the the thumb rule is basically like any click should be tracked. But then, obviously, uh, so the first level of filtration is any click. Okay. And then after that, you can filter it to any useful click, right? So now, what is your goal? If the app's goal is, let's say, uh, watch a movie, right? So clicks which lead to the movie, you should track that. Uh, same like for transactions, like add to cart and then, you know, or uh, add to cart and buy, right? So, and, uh, you can go as deep as you want. For example, if it's if it's an e-commerce app, you can track uh, the categories which they are seeing, you know, the items which they are seeing. You can track all of that. Uh, so the more data you collect, you will get to know more about what the user is doing, right? Uh, and it's not just like from screen to screen. Like you know, uh, the Google Analytics gives you like that, uh, you know, a diagram, right? Like okay, the home screen, and then these many people went to the screen. Uh, I think more than that, it's about what they see on the screen as well, right? Like it's did they, they see your, uh, uh, you know, the jacket collection or the shoes collection or something like that, or did they see the category like a drama or you know a fiction, science fiction uh, TV show or something like that? So all that becomes important because now you know that this person likes science fiction, and the next best science fiction show on your platform, you push it to that person, and that that basically tells the uh, user that okay, you know what, this app has good science fiction shows, so I should buy a subscription for it, stuff like that. So. Yeah, so I would say first is track all clicks and then uh, get some data out of it and then track useful clicks and then try to make meaning out of it that you know what more data you want to collect or less you want to collect. So it, it, it has to be iterative. It can't be like one approach for this. Right now, like in Expanded I'm seeing this even for loading the thing. I don't know what's thing it is. And we just started with this Anyone else? Uh, I think we are good, man. Uh, thank you so much for coming on a Friday evening. Uh, Dive to during our So yeah, thank you so much.